place in the whole wide world is in the will of God because if I ever find myself in his will and in trouble at the same time, I can depend on him to get me out of it. Ah, oh my son. Can I suggest to all of us that the tomb for us is not the evidence that he is who he says he is. You are the evidence. If we can get the right people in the right place, uh, moving in the right direction, uh, eyes have not seen, uh, ears have not heard, uh, neither have it entered into the hearts of men, uh, the things that God has in store. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. Gracious Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you tonight for all that you have done for us as individuals and all that you have done for us as people who belong to you, who trust you, who lean and depend upon you. I thank you for all that you have done. We cannot thank you enough for your grace, for your mercy, for your favor, that rests upon each and every one of us. And tonight, as we go into your word, I pray that something will be said or done today that will cause us to draw closer to you, to understand your word more perfectly. And then God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, Thank you for another day. Thank you for another opportunity. And God, we're so grateful and thankful. Help us not to take this opportunity for granted, nor any opportunity that you bring us into. Help us not to take it for granted, but help us to see, hear, and know the things that we need to see, hear, and know. And we'll be ever grateful and thankful. And we'll, God, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let me put my prompts on the screen uh, real quick. God bless and praise the Lord to each and every one of you on tonight. We trust that uh, you've had a productive day and that you are prepared to go into the word of the Lord as we study uh, collectively on tonight, uh, making sure that uh, all is well with you. And trusting that that is the case, that all is well with you and that God is continuing to give you strength and wisdom in this season uh, that we find ourselves in. We're in the month of August, eighth month of the year, and um, God has given us, again, another opportunity to grow and glean together. And so I'm trusting that you already know the drill. If you're connected here, if you are a member of Greater Faith Bible Tabernacle, you already know you should have something to write with, something to write on uh, as we study God's word together. And so take a moment, gather your uh, material so that we can prepare to study God's word together. I need your help tonight. Help me evangelize. Help me get the word out that impact is on right now. You've got social media, share this link on YouTube with your social media page. Uh, if you wanna text this link to someone, please do that. One of the easiest ways to do it, all you have to do is text greateristhere.org. Tell them to log on to the live broadcast. It'll bring them to this lesson where they can click and join us in real time. 
Let's fill up the virtual sanctuary tonight. Let's take a moment, invite someone to be a part of our Bible study tonight. Greater Faith, I'm thankful and grateful that you are here, but let's take a moment and invite someone else to be a part of our Bible study on tonight. Let them know where to find us. Let them know how to get a hold of us. Let others know that it's time to get into the word of the Lord. And I'm pressing us just a little bit today uh, because of what we're going to be sharing uh, in our Bible study on tonight. I want as many as can to hear what the Lord will share with us on tonight. It's going to be a little rocky, um, seems to be the case with this series, um, but I'm thankful for the feedback that you have been giving me through text messages or emails saying how this series is being a blessing to you. And so we want to be a blessing to even more. And so take a moment uh, like this, comment in the chat area, invite someone, share this, tag someone uh, if you don't mind. Let them know that Midweek Impact is on right now. Of course, as always, the prayer line is always open. All you have to do is text either prayer to 866-371-1832 or you can just simply scan that code there on the screen and you will be prompted to fill in what you want us to pray with you for and about. And we will do our level best to pray with you and believe God with you. Now, if you've been coming here for quite some time and God's been ministering to you from this platform, from this ministry, uh, from this local church, Greater Faith Bible Tabernacle, Buffalo, New York, and uh, maybe God's been ministering to you about connecting in a more concrete way. I invite you to scan that code there on the screen and join us in membership. It's a very simple form that you can fill out. And once you do that, uh, we'll be prompted in the office. We'll reach back out to you to let you know that we're excited to walk with you in this portion of the journey that God has called you into in this form of discipleship or in the form of just building community. Uh, that's one of the things we just uh, recently had a board uh, meeting uh, just last Saturday. And one of the things I shared with them is that we're doing, trying to do our best and doing a better job, I can say it that way, of trying to build community within Greater Faith Bible Tabernacle. We've had so many who have connected recently uh, with our church. And so we want to make sure that no one gets left out and that we do a better job as a church of connecting just in fellowship. Um, I'm reminded that the scripture says they continued in the apostles doctrine and in the breaking of bread and in fellowship. And so uh, as we come together, that's one level of fellowship. Um, but I'm reminded that we don't always have to have a service to fellowship. All right. And so but we're grateful uh, for the times of fellowship that we do have once coming up this coming uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, we will not be here on campus. We'll be at Front Park if the weather uh, cooperates with us. Uh, full disclosure, because of my schedule, I'm actually taping this on Tuesday morning. You're watching this on Wednesday evening, but I'm actually taping this on Tuesday morning. And as I look outside, it's raining, it's storming, uh, water is falling, rain is falling. And um, hopefully that won't happen on this coming Sunday. But if the weather reports say that rain is threatening, then of course we will meet here, 375 Edison Avenue, uh, Buffalo, New York, right here in the sanctuary of Greater Faith Bible Tabernacle. But we're believing God and trusting God that Greater is coming to Front Park August Sunday, August the 21st at 10 a.m. It's an outdoor fellowship, outdoor worship, outdoor word. And so bring your lawn chairs, bring your lawn chairs, bring food for you, for your family, uh, and an open heart. Uh, we have invited the neighborhood to come and be a part of that service. And so uh, we want you to make sure that you are present uh, there at Front Park. And so do me a favor and let's just 
permeate the chat area and put in the chat area, greater is coming to Front Park. Greater is coming to Front Park. Greater is coming to Front Park. Now, uh, I want to encourage you, service starts at 10 a.m. I encourage you uh, to probably make sure that you arrive, let's say around 9.35. 9:35 in the morning, which is the normal time that we would have our pre-service prayer, just so that you make it to the, to the spot where we're going to be fellowshipping and worshiping and things of that nature. We've got some free things that we're going to give to those that are there, those who are our, our special guests. Of course, you can invite uh, special guests to be a part uh, of our service outside in this community. And so, but we want you to make sure that you don't miss any of the service. So I'm encouraging you to arrive around 9.35, 9.40-ish, just so that you are in the right spot and you don't miss any of the service. It's going to be an abbreviated service, all right? It's going to be an abbreviated service. We will not have the service portion of our fellowship as long as we, we have um, service in here um, because... Uh, we're going to be outside. There's some things that are going to be happening there. And so we want to make sure, again, that we make good use of our time of, of fellowship and worship and, and the word. Now, we have been told um, several weeks back that we were not allowed to bring in um, our instruments and speakers and things of that nature, microphones. And so we've been trying to find a creative way to make sure that we are heard on that day. And so what I'm also going to ask you to do is I'm asking you to bring your phones, bring your tablets, um, and you may have to use your phone as a hotspot. And uh, we're going to try our best to go live so just so that we can be heard, all right? So at 10 a.m., we'll go live at the same place that you would normally go to watch our Bible studies, our Sunday morning services. And we're, we're going to try to go live from location uh, for two reasons. One, just so that we can be heard. And then two, so that those who are members of our church who do not live in the area, they'll be able to be uh, uh, able to participate. So that's the plan. Uh, we've been trying to figure out how to do it. So praise and worship is going to be different, um, which is wonderful because the Bible says that you and I should open up our mouths and we should praise God and give God glory. And so this is a wonderful opportunity, you know, for you to give God the joyful noise uh, that you can offer. And as the psalmist said in one of the choir songs years ago, Jesus loves to hear the sound of your praise, all right? And so this will give us a wonderful opportunity to sing some congregational songs together. And then with your prayers and with your support, we'll try to share something out of the word of God in this abbreviated service. And then we'll move into fellowship and eating and just having a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. I just want to take a moment and share that. Um, and please make sure you share what I, what I just shared. Share that with other family members just so that, again, we're moving in the right direction. I'm going to try to send out a video uh, via our text messaging system just to remind us, you know, what to look forward to, you know, when to show up and things of that nature, again, so that we're all in uh, at the same place at the same time. Uh, enjoying the fellowship, and my goodness, it is coming down. Again, I'm, I'm in the sanctuary on a Tuesday morning, and it has started to pour again. We're trusting that that will not be the case on, uh, on tomorrow or on Sunday, all right? Let me see. Have I missed anything? Have I missed anything? All right, we're in our series entitled Lines in the Sand. We're in our series entitled Lines in the in the sand. And one of the things that we have been attempting to do is to stress the fact from Joshua 24, verse number 15, where Joshua, in his farewell speech to the nation of Israel, he gives them this proposition. He says to them, if you think it is evil, it is negative, it is a bad idea to serve God, 
then make a choice today whether you're going to serve idols or whether you're going to serve God. He gives them that opportunity to exercise their ability. Let me say it this way, their God-given ability to make a decision. God is, um, how can I say this? God is so wise. It's not the best word. Um, God is so strong in his ability um, to allow us to choose. God could have created us like robots and forced us to do certain things, you know, to worship him, to praise him. You know, God could have created us uh, like robots and on demand, you know, force us, you know, hit a button as it were and force all of creation all at once to give him praise and to give him glory. But he didn't do that. He didn't force us, you know, and create us in such a way that it, he forces us to act as robots and, um, and, and praise him and serve him without the ability of choice. God created you with choice. God created me with the ability to choose Hear me carefully, greater faith, and those of you that are watching. Not only did God give me the ability to choose, but God has given me the ability to even choose against him. I'm going to say that again. God has given me the ability that if I so desire, I can choose even not to follow him. It's not the wisest decision that I could make, but he does give me the ability to choose to follow him. And so when Joshua shares with the nation of Israel in his farewell speech, he underscores the fact that God has given the nation the ability after all that God had done, hear me greater faith, after all that God had done for Israel, after all that God had done for his people, after all the ways he has made, the provisions, the blessings, the healings, the deliverances, the ways that were made, out of all of those things, he still gave them a choice to choose not to follow God. And so what we find in scripture is that he says, listen, you can choose to serve other gods if you want to. Joshua 24, verse 15. He, but he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, he draws a line in the sand. You can do what you want to do. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so this past Sunday, I don't know how well we did uh, this past Sunday. A few of you... Um, Actually, a few of you actually reached out to me and said I was in your business this Sunday uh, without even talking to you or understanding what's going on in your life. So I just believe by the help of the Lord and through confirmation that we're in the right spot in this series. And on this past Sunday, Joshua chapter number 23, we went back a, a, a chapter. The farewell speech that Joshua gives goes from 23 to 24. Um, and then, of course, from uh, the end of 24, we go into the book of Judges. And so, again, farewell speech by Joshua. And Joshua, I want to bring us back to, see if I can bring this up on the screen. I want to bring us back to Joshua 23, verses 12 through 13. Joshua 23, verses 12 through 13. The Bible says these words, Else if Ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these, of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you know for a surety. We didn't get to this in, on Sunday. We didn't get to verse 13 on Sunday. But he says, know for a surety that the Lord your God will no longer drive out any of these nations from before you, uh, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your side and thorns in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land. If you've got your own Bible, underline that phrase, this good land, which the Lord, and I think the verse uh, is cut off, but which the Lord promised you. 
And so I want us to understand something. I want us to understand something very quickly. Uh, well, let me make sure I, I, I've read this uh, correctly. I've got my Bible here. And um, let's see. All right. I just want to make sure I get the tail in. I think the, the slide that I had kind of um, chopped it off. Uh, so so he, he says, No for short assurity that the Lord your God will no longer drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you, scourges in your side, thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. That's the full verse there. Which the Lord your God has given to you. This past Sunday, we were talking about this unique warning because he talks about not marrying um, the nation. And remember from Sunday, God is slow walking them into their blessing. God's not bringing them into all of the land all at once. He's doing it little by little. And so in the process of bringing Israel into the land, they have to coexist for time with other nations in the land that God's going to bring them into and into ownership fully. And so what Joshua does is Joshua reminds them, you're going to have to coexist with nations who do not believe what you believe. You're going to have to live in the same land, in the same country with people who do not believe what you believe. I hope you're hearing me tonight. He says, you're going to have to live with people until God brings you into full ownership of the land, full ownership of the country, full ownership of the region. You're going to have to coexist with these people. And what he says is, he says, do not, don't, don't worship their gods, don't even mention their names. But then he says, be careful that you don't marry them. Don't give your daughters to their sons. Don't take any of their daughters for your, son and, for your sons and marry. And we dealt with, this past Sunday, we dealt with the fact that God did not give this, um, this edict, this law, this command, that God didn't say this because he was trying to preserve a nation. That was not God's idea. That was not God's intent. God was not trying to preserve a nation just so that there was purity in the blood and the bloodline lasts. No, 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 no. Because we read several verses of scripture that talk about the fact that he told them that if this happened, if this intermarrying marrying happens, he says that their sons will turn your daughters away from me or their daughters will turn your sons away from me. The issue was not trying to preserve a nation or preserve a bloodline, it was trying to preserve relationship with God and covenant with God. And so what we attempted to share this past Sunday was that if, any, if I'm in any connection, if I'm in any association, if I'm in any type of relationship and my Christian witness is being compromised, and if, if I find myself doing, saying, talking, believing, what they believe, it cannot be the kind of relationship that God wants me to have. All right. So I don't want to relitigate that case uh, on today because I've got my own controversy that we need to be able to get into uh, in the next um, in the next 35 minutes or, or so. So I'm hoping that you've taken some you've taken some time. Strap yourself in. Those of you that are watching that are not members of Greater Faith Bible Tabernacle, we welcome you at this time as well. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're joining us in this Bible study and you are not a member of Greater Faith, put guest in the comment section. We do know that there are people who are not members who join us every week and we welcome you and we thank God for your presence in our Bible study. But if you're rel relatively new to our Bible study, new to this ministry, put guest in the comment section. We want to know that you're, you're walking with us, tracking with us, and uh, we'll greet you in the chat area. No one's going to slide into your DMs. You know, no one's going to privately messenger you, um, but we'll greet you right there in that chat area so everyone can see. Amen. Amen. God bless you. All right. Now, so strap in. Let's go a little bit deeper. 
One of the things I shared on this past Sunday was to be aware of what is referred to as syncretism. Syncretism. Syncretism is the amalgamation or the attempted amalgamation of different religions, cultures, or schools of thought. That's what syncretism is. Syncretism is trying to, you know, connect everything together. Some of you have probably seen those bumper stickers that spell out the word coexist, but they use Christian or religious symbols to spell out the word coexist. All right. And so I understand if I can say it this way, I understand the idea behind the fact that in this country called America, that we have freedom to worship as we please. At least we have it right now. But the point I'm making is we're not saying and telling someone else you can't worship however you want to worship. We're not arguing that because in this country, you have the freedom to do so. Now, here's the point. Just because I have the freedom to do it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm supposed to do it or that I should do it or that even having the legal right to do something is what God wants me to do. All right. So just because it's legal doesn't make it righteous. And we've got to be able in this country to draw that line in the sand and say just because it's legal doesn't mean that it is righteous or it will put me in right standing with God. I don't want to spend much time there, but here again, syncretism. Let me put it up on the screen. Syncretism is the amalgamation. It is the marrying. It is the bringing into or the attempted amalgamation of different religions, cultures, and schools of thought. All right. Uh, and, and so what he did not want them to do is to live in the same region, live in the same country and then practice syncretism where they are worshiping God and worshiping idols, too, where they are sacrificing to the true God in the Old Testament under the law, sacrificing peace offerings, sin offerings, and then also uh, uh, offering sacrifice to false gods or uh, to, to idols. He did not want them to do that. And again, he was not trying to preserve a race. He was trying to preserve relationship and covenant. He was not trying to do, you know, you know, some religious thing, you know, some racial thing, some prejudice thing. No, no, no. He was trying to make sure that covenant was intact. And so you and I cannot afford to practice syncretism where you and I are mixing religions. I, I, used, um, I used, you know, horoscopes and uh, astrologists uh, and astrology signs, you know, Arius and, you know, uh, Pisces and Leo and Sagittarius, you know. I'm seeing more of that, even um, more of that language, even among the people of God, where we will meet people. Can, uh, okay, I, I can't be nobody but myself. There was a time when we would meet people in an effort to date or get to know people. We would ask them, you know, what church they went to, how long they had been saved, how long they had been, you know, you know, born again and things like that. Now what we do is we ask about education. We ask about what sign that person is, you know, and then, you know, if we talk anything about belief systems and things of that nature, we might ask from a church context, well, do you go to church? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, we almost do like this. Whew, all right, at least they go to church. <laughs> but you didn't ask how often they go. You don't know if they're saved. You don't know if they're spirit filled. You don't know if they've had their sins washed away. All you know is that they go to church. And the truth be told, there are people who have been saved, who have been born again, and they go to church and they don't even pay attention in church. Let me stop right there. I want us, because I really want us to understand this. I really want us to understand this. The idea is not, do you go to church? The idea is, <laughs> do, do you, um, oh God, I'm trying to remember two things at, at once. Um, uh, Bishop, Bishop-elect Marvin Winans was preaching or teaching one time, and he was talking about the, the same thing where people are asking, you know, do you go to church? And he said, stop asking people, do they go to church? Ask them, do they worship, do they worship the Lord? 
you know, because worship is inclusive of lifestyle. Let me check my time. Worship is inclusive of a lifestyle. So if I know that, listen, if I know you go to church, I'm assuming some things. But if you tell me you are a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you if you tell me that you worship God in spirit and in truth, hear me carefully. It's not that I want to ask these other questions, but I have a little bit more of a of a sense of the kind of person you are and your relationship with God. All right. And, and, and ladies, let me tell you something. Men who you think are always quiet and all that kind of stuff. All you have to do is watch a sporting event with men and you will find that, that men can get loud. All right. Here's the point I'm making. If you start talking about, you know, you know, not necessarily do you go to church, but are you saved? Are you born again? Are you spirit filled? You know, are you, do you do you worship God? You know, people are like who's going to ask them questions like you asking everything else. You know, do you got a baby mama? Do, do, do how many children do you have? You, you're asking everything. Where do you work? You know, you know, what kind of car do you drive? We're asking all these other things. Don't be ashamed to ask these things concerning their walk with God. Hear me carefully. And, and so we're, we're asking these things. We're asking these questions. If that person is like, well, you know, you know, I, you know, I, I go from time to time. You know, I, you know, I, I grew up in church. Mm-mm. No, 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 no. <laughs> we're not. No, no. That's that's not what you want to see. Out of a man or a woman, you, you want someone to say, yes, I, I'm saved. I'm born again. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm, and I'm, I'm saved and I'm glad about it. Yes, I, I'm saved. I'm born again. I got saved when I was this. I got saved when I was that. But if you get into a, you get into a conversation and it's always this, you know, well, you know, I, I, I grew up in church. OK, you're grown now. That, that's been a, several decades since you were a little person. So, so, so what do you do now? So don't tell me, you know, I grew up in church or, you know, from time to time I go to my grandmother's church. What is that? <laughs> That's not an answer. It's not a full answer that doesn't help you to decide whether or not they're walking with the Lord or not. And again, I know this seems like it's antiquated, but so many of us have gotten our our emotions and our feelings in relationships and we've connected on several different levels. But spiritually, we're not at the same place. This is what Jesus, this is what God was after when dealing with syncretism. I don't want you, it's not about you marrying them. It's about what I know that they're going to do. They're going to turn your heart away from me. I got to move on. I got to move on. So so we got to be careful that, that we're not practicing, you know, you know, Middle Eastern meditation and prayer at the same time. We're not, we're not trying to mix things. You know, I'm, I'm chanting and hitting a bowl and, and, and meditating and then trying to quote scripture at the same time. That's, that's syncretism. <laughs> Hear me very carefully. Syncretism. I'm not praying to the ancestors. It's quiet. I know it. I know it. I know it. But it's, I have to sound an alarm because when the righteous are saying things like, just put it out in the, just put it out in the universe. When the righteous are saying, you know, um, God is and, and universe and, and um, uh, uh, so what's well, some of the other things that, 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 that we hear from time to time? I know some of you are going to put it in the chat area. But Timoshia, hallelujah, I got to sound an alarm. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I have to sound an alarm so that we're not moving in the opposite direction. Syncretism. When I engage, God help me here. When I engage in syncretism, it's not just about worshiping idols and ancestors and and all. It's not just that. But I can can get into, because syncretism is not just about, let me put it back on the screen. Excuse me. Syncretism is not just about religion. It's also culture. Schools of thought. That's also included in syncretism. And so hear my heart when I say this. I've got to sound an alarm for those of us who are righteous. I have to sound an alarm. Making sure that our language is that of what we believe. That our language 
is that of, of the belief system that we find, <clears throat> excuse me, that we find uh, laid out for us in the Holy Scriptures. Be proud of your heritage. You know, I'm, I, I am proud of the fact that I have traced my bloodline as far as I could go to uh, Kalabar Cross River in Nigeria. I'm proud of that fact. <clears throat> that the earliest person in my family that I know of uh, came over from Africa in the 1800s, um, early 1800s or so. And uh, I'm proud of that. You know, if God give me enough days and enough money, I want to go there. I want to put my foot on that continent. I want to put my feet in that country, in that city, in that region. I'm proud of that. But that doesn't make me. Hallelujah. Glory to God's name. That doesn't make me. I'm proud of that. But I'm not changing my lifestyle just because I found that out about myself. Hallelujah. Glory to God's name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm proud of it. I'm excited about that. You know, try to even find something on Instagram, you know, uh, in that region so I can at least follow and see the culture and things of that nature. I'm interested. I'm excited about that. Thankful about that. But hear me carefully. That doesn't make me. It's a part of who I am, but that's not all of who I am. My last name is Fair. It's French. <laughs> you know, and I, I, you know, so I know, you know, we got it from somebody else. But the point I'm making is just being a fair is not all of who I am. I am also a child of the living God. I am also in the family of God. I am also uh, in the kingdom of God. And so my language is fair. It's African-American, but it is also kingdom. Glory to God's name. I'm trying to move on from this point. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm trying to move on because I want to be able to share something different, you know, uh, on, on this coming Sunday. And so there are five things that happens that he tells them. He says, I, I don't want you to marry them. But then he said, here are the consequences. If you, if you do these things, look at Joshua 23 and verse number 13. The Bible says these words. He says, know for a surety that the Lord your God, one, will no longer drive out any of these nations. Two, they shall be snares and traps unto you. Three, scourges in your sight. Four, thorns in your eyes. Five, until you perish off of this good land. Well, what does that mean? There are five things that will happen if they cross the line. Favor is going to be lifted. God says, I've been fighting for you, but I'm not going to fight for you as I could fight for you. Because you have crossed that line. He says they're going to be traps unto you, snares to you. You felt freer before you got connected to this person, to this friend, to this association, to, to, to this company. He says, and then th th there's a level of punishment that, that will come. Scourges in your side. If you look it up and study it, it literally means uh, to, to be whipped. One translation talks about a sharp stick in your side, but it literally means to be whipped, to be scourged. Then he says it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to be thorns in your eyes. Thorns, imagine it, thorns in your eyes. What does that mean? Vision is going to be obstructed. You won't be able to see. You know, you could hear God, could see God clearly, but as soon as you got connected where you've been connected, all of a sudden now I can't see God, I can't hear God, I can't, I can't do the things that I used to do. Hear me carefully. Then he says, he says, until you slowly perish off of that land. Well, what does that literally mean? You will slowly lose what God has given to you. Inch by inch, you will lose what God has given to you. And I don't think that that is God's design for any of us to lose what he wants us to have. I hope this is making sense. Now, I want to spend the rest of the time. I don't have much, but I got 21 minutes or so. I want to spend the remainder of this time. I want to talk about this. It's going to get a little controversial, so 
Strap in. What happens? We've been talking about drawing lines in the sand. What happens when the lines get blurred? What happens when you draw the line, but we blur the line? I want you to consider something here in James chapter number five. Make a note of this. James chapter number five, verse number 12. It's in the King James and in the New Living Translation there on the screen. But above all things, brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth. That's also you'll find that in the Old Testament. Neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. New Living Translation says just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. You said, Pastor, what does that have to do with blurring the lines? One of the things that you see that we see in the scripture, James 5 and uh, chapter 5, verse number 12, he says, don't swear by heaven nor by the earth nor by any other oath. Now, there are people, I, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I, I, I swear on my mama's grave, you know, on my mama, you know, on my daddy. Do, do, do. God said, don't do that. <laughs> people do that kind of stuff, making these oaths, because people's words started to mean less. And there came a time when people would make an oath connected to, please hear me, connected to a respected person in their family that may have passed on. And it was a sign of disrespect if you would make an oath or cut a covenant using that uh, family member who had been deceased, some may call them an ancestor, and, and use their name. And then your word uh, seemed like it carried more weight because they felt like you wouldn't disrespect, hear me carefully, you wouldn't disrespect your grandmother, you wouldn't disrespect your father. So there came a time when people started saying, you know, I swear on my mama's grave. Don't walk out of class yet. I, I swear, swear on my grandfather's grave. You know, on, on my children's life. You know, people say all that kind of stuff in an effort to just say, you know, you know I'm serious when I say whatever I'm saying. James says, don't do all that. Just say yes or no and do what you're going to say. Build your, in, your integrity not based on an oath, but based upon you doing what you say you would do. Please stay with me. Because there's a larger point I believe God wants to make with us tonight. There's a larger point that I believe God is trying to make with us tonight. Because it's not just about just saying yes or no, but life can be just so much simpler if we just said yes or no. I know there are a lot of people who live in the gray areas. You know, we live in the gray areas. That's, that's when lines are, have, have been blurred. And I want, I want to show you something. C consider this. I remember when life was so simple. You did or you didn't. You would or you wouldn't. But it ain't like that anymore. I remember when life was so easy. People said what they meant, and they were either for it or against, but it's not like that anymore. That's a, taken from a, a whining song way, 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 way back in the day, entitled Bring Back the Days of Yea and Nay. What, 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 what were they pointing to? That things were simpler when people said, yes, I'm coming, no, I'm not. Yes, I believe in this. No, I do not believe in this because life was so simple. Now, I know there are a lot of people who don't like black and white. And a lot of people don't like, you know, you know, you know, definite answers. You're just trying to do. You should be able to give a definite answer. OK, OK, OK. One of the issues, get myself together. One of the issues that we're finding is that because lines have been blurred, we, we're dealing now with confusion. Please stay with me. Make a note of this. Somebody put it in the chat area as well. When the lines are blurred, it can lead to confusion. 
Oh, I believe in God. Well, not really. When the lines are blurred, it leads to confusion. Put it in your notes. Somebody help me teach tonight. Put it in the chat area. I got about 14 minutes. I want to try to wrap this up, but please stay with me. What happens when the lines get blurred? You have confusion. If you're driving down the street and you see the line that's there, the dotted line, or the, you know, and all of a sudden it just it moves over, or sometimes you don't see the line, you don't know where you can and cannot drive. You don't know where you can and cannot, you know, park the car or whatever, because it, it, there's confusion. When the lines are blurred, you have confusion. I want you to see something here. I want you to see something here. I was talking to one of my spiritual brothers, Pastor Aaron Porter, and, um, you know, me and some friends of ours, you know, I call them my, my spiritual brothers, and um, we chat from time to time. And in that chat, he posted an article from ABC News. And as soon as he posted it, I said, thank you, because I need this for next week's lesson, which is tonight's lesson. Recently, talking about when the lines are blurred, recently, ABC News identified 58 gender options. 58 gender options. Hear me, 58, 58 choices of gender options. In other words, you could, in this society, you could decide, I'm this and I'm looking for this in a relationship. Hear me carefully. Because I'm this, I'm looking for this, all right? That person could very well say after a whole year, you know, I'm going to pick something else. So now you don't know what to do because they've now picked something else. Now our society says, well, just, you, just, you just got to love them. I don't know how to love them. They, 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 they've just shifted on me. Now I have to learn how to love them because they've shifted now. Okay, um, let me see if I can do this. You, you probably won't be able to see it. You probably won't be able to see it. You probably won't be able to see it. But look at this. This is a partial list. I'll take my glasses off. There's agender. There's androgyny. There's androgynous. There's bi-gender. There's cisgender. There's cis. There's cisgender, cis female, cis male, cis man, cis woman, cisgender female, cisgender male, cisgender man, cisgender uh, woman, female to male, F T M, gender fluid, Whew. gender nonconforming, gender questioning, gender variant. Gender queer, intersexual, male to female, MTF. I'm neither. <laughs> non binary. I am other. I'm pangender. I'm trans. Look at this for trans. That little red line that you see there is a portion of the uh, uh, previous list, but you, you, you've got trans female. Um, you, you've got trans male. You've got trans person. You've got trans woman. You've got trans feminine, transgender, transgender female, transgender male, transgender man, transgender person, transgender woman, transgender, uh, trans masculine, transsexual, transsexual female, transsexual male, transsexual man, transsexual person, transsexual woman, two spirits. <laughs> when the lines are blurred. What do you mean by the lines? If I go back to Genesis, Scripture says he made them, he, who is our creator, made them male and female. But now in our society, 
you now have 58 versions of what we call gender identity. I'm not arguing right and wrong right now. I'm just laying a table so that you and I will understand you got blurry lines now. Blurry lines now. And I know people like to live in blurry lines, but this is one of the things I have noticed. And here is the main issue. Here's the main issue. And I want you to write this down because I may not be able to go much further than, than this, but stay with me for the next uh, nine minutes or so. Confusion is non-productive. I know it sounds simple, but please capture this. Confusion is non-productive. When the lines are blurred, you then have what's called confusion. And when you have confusion, confusion is non-productive. You can't get things done. You cannot have the kind of fruit. You cannot have the kind of manifestation. You cannot have the kind of, uh, of, of, of goal setting or, or whatever it is. When there is confusion, you will not have the kind of productivity that you desire to have. Why? Because there is confusion. The Bible talks about a double-minded person being unstable in all their ways. Confusion. Well, I believe the scripture is right concerning salvation. Well, I used to believe it, but now I don't believe on all that. Confusion. I hope you're catching this tonight. Because we're living in some confusing times. I wouldn't want to have to date. And I understand, hear me, I understand why some in the church find it difficult to date. Because if you got to deal with 58 different kinds of gender identities, you don't know what you're getting. One comedian talked about, you know, dating. And they said, you know, if you're going to date somebody in this season, you better make sure that you've got pictures of them in elementary school so you know what you're getting. <laughs> hear me very carefully. I, I, I want to see your kindergarten picture. You know, what did, Mrs., what did Miss Jackson call you? You know, you, you might be Bob now, but, 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 but did, did Mrs. Jackson, your, your kindergarten teacher, your first grade teacher, she called you Bernadette. Y'all not going to talk to me here. Confusion. And I'm not throwing hate and stone. No, no, no. I'm just saying this is where we are. If that's where you are, that's just where you are. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. I'm not upset with anybody. I just want you to hear my heart when I say this, when there is confusion. I hope you don't have any children in the room with these next seven minutes. When there is confusion, I'll give you a fair warning. When there is confusion, there's non-productivity. When, when there is confusion... And I know people, you know, uh, you, know, we, you know, we don't have definite lines, you know, you know, male roles, female roles. No, we just, you know, we're doing, when you've got confusion, people don't know what to do. Open the door for one person, try to open up for another person. I don't need nobody to open no door for me. All right, okay, all right. You date somebody else, you, because of the, what the last person said, you know, now you've got to have this whole conversation. Do you, do you like it when somebody opened the door for you? Did? That's just where we are. I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about heaven or hell. I'm just saying that's just where we are. And where we are is confusing. And when there is confusion, you will have a lack of productivity. One of the things, I don't have time to do this tonight, but write down 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Just write down the whole chapter. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, Paul talks about how to avoid confusion when operating in spiritual gifts in the local church. I'm not going to teach on it tonight. Maybe we'll come back to this on, 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 on next Wednesday. I want to teach something different on Sunday because we're going to be outside and I don't want to continue the series as, as at least I don't think God's going to um, move us in, in that particular vein. But write down 
1 Corinthians chapter number 14, because Paul is teaching on how to operate with spiritual gifts in the local church. And in chapter 14, he's particularly talking about tongues and interpretation of tongues. Now, let me just give clarity here on speaking in tongues. Because there are people that believe you should never speak in tongues in a corporate setting because there is no interpretation. If there's no interpretation, then you are in sin. Let's just see what the Bible says. First Corinthians chapter 14, verses two through four. The Bible says these words Paul is teaching for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto who? Unto God. Everybody say, I'm not talking to you. For no man understandeth him, howbeit the spirit he speaketh, how, how, howbeit rather, in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Look at verse number three. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's why everybody who think that you're called to prophesy, look what New Testament prophecy looks like. It looks like edification, exhortation, and comfort. Verse number four, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, what? Edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth does what? Edifies the church. All right, so we see that clarity there. Now, there are times what Paul talks about in the remainder of the chapter is there are times when God wants to give a message to the church and he uses unknown tongues to give a message to a local assembly. In that case, for the local assembly, for the people to receive the message, there must be interpretation or else the people hearing what they hear in an unknown tongue spiritual language, glossolalia, when that happens, no one is edified because no one knows what you said. Hear me carefully. In the case of God giving a message to the church, if I stood at Front Park and I got up and I told you all to log in so you can hear what I'm saying, and when, I, when you logged in, all you heard was me speaking in tongues. I'm speaking in tongues. Most of you wouldn't have any idea, any clue of what I'm saying. So you're not being edified. You're not being strengthened. You're not being comforted because you have no idea what I'm saying. But in that same setting, if I'm worshiping, I'm talking to God, I'm praying and I'm praying in the Holy Ghost and I begin to speak in tongues. I'm not talking to the congregation. I'm not ministering in a word of prophecy, of, of exhortation and comfort. Uh, I'm not talking to the congregation in that moment, in that season. What I'm doing is I am edifying myself. So the next time somebody tells you, you, know, you speak in tongues, y'all shouldn't be doing this. We, we don't have an interpretation. Show them this verse of scripture because you have to know why you do what you do and you've got to have, you've got to be able to, and should have scripture to back up why you do what you do. All right. So he gives that level of clarity, but then he begins to speak regarding um, the, the idea that that there should be interpretation when there is a message that's going to be given. And he says in chapter number 14 that when something like this happens, he talks about how it is a sign to the unbeliever. Because the person that's speaking in tongues, giving the message of prophecy to the congregation and the person that interprets the tongues oftentimes are two different people who didn't get a chance to talk before service and say, all right, I'm going to say this, and then you say this. So it is a sign to the unbeliever that something supernatural has just happened in the sanctuary. Oh, God, how far can I go? I'm right at my time. So what was happening in the Corinthian church was you had spirit-filled people who had the gift of interpretation. Some had the gift of diverse tongues, and um, being able to speak in tongues, and some had the ability to interpret tongues. But what happened in the Corinthian church, which was the reason why Paul had to correct them and bring clarity, was because anytime someone felt like it, they just got up and did. All right. So if someone felt like they had a message and were giving it in tongues, and somebody else felt like they had a song and they were getting ready to sing their song, they would do it all at once. So you've got confusion. 
because somebody's singing, somebody's speaking in tongues, trying to give a message to the church. The interpretation is not being given, so people are not being fruitful. You've got a bunch of confusion going on in that church. And what ends up happening is Paul says these words, for God is not the author of what? Confusion, but of peace as in all of the churches of the saints. He's not the author of confusion. And so when I understand that, I understand that if God's not the author of confusion as it relates to spiritual giftings, the principle is God's not the author of confusion, period, full stop. God's not, the confusion in our world is not, is not coming from God. The confusion around uh, certain uh, standards or certain moral behavior or the lack thereof and, and the blurring of lines, that's not coming from God. God said, I make them male and female. He didn't say cisgender. He didn't say non-binary. He said, I created them male and female. That's how God said it. What we've done is taken what God has said and we've added 58, at least 58 different variations of what God has said. And now there's confusion because I just don't know what I'm going to get. I could marry somebody. And then all of a sudden they decide, well, I'm, I'm, I'm turning into a man uh, or, or you know, I'm turning into a woman. I just I've always felt female. I've always felt male. Now I don't know what to do. Because I married one thing. Now you're telling me you're something else. Or maybe you want to stay female, but you now are cis or non-binary, non-conforming. Now, I don't know what to do. It's confusing. And God says in his word, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't. I didn't. What you all are confused, are confused about with sexuality and gender roles and all that kind of that, that didn't come from me. What's the point I'm making tonight as I close? The point I'm making tonight is if this confusion did not come from God, then why would I sign up to endorse it? Why would I, why would I sign up and say, you know what, because, you know, because of, you know, the way society, I'm just going to go along with it because that's what's going on in our day and our time. Why would I sign up to co-sign? I'm just asking the question. That's all I'm doing tonight. I'm just asking the question. Why would I sign up to co-sign something and it's not God's will? It's not God's way. God says, I, I, I'm not confused as to what I've done. God says, I, I'm, I'm not confused about what I've said. I'm not confused by, by what I've created. You all can be confused if you want to. He says, I'm not. And when there is confusion, let me end with this. When there's confusion, there's no productivity. You, you can't get, God says, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. Y'all too, y'all do it. Watch this. We have created, we'll get back to this, but I just want you to hear my heart, hear the word of God. I want you to see something here. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as it is in all of the churches of the saints. Confusion in this verse of scripture literally means instability, disorder, commotion, tumult. That's what confusion means in verse 33 of 1 Corinthians 14. God says, I didn't write that. I didn't come up with that definition. God says, I didn't create non-binary. Y'all did that. God, God, God says, I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't create transgender. Y'all did that. I didn't do that. And at some point, we must draw the line as to what we believe according to the scripture, even though society says there's 58 versions of what could be. When God says, I know what I created. I want to stop here and I want to pray.
I want to stop here and I want to pray. I want you to pray with me. I hope this made sense. I may have gotten on somebody's nerves tonight. I don't know. I know I'm over time. And so let's, let's pray. Let's believe God together. I want you to go back over what we've, what we've shared tonight. We're going to add some more to it on Wednesday. Next Wednesday, the Lord say the same. But I, I really want us to, to understand what God is saying. Because what happens when the lines are, are blurred? One of the things I discovered that when the lines are blurred, there's no responsibility. I can't hold you accountable or responsible when the lines are blurred. That's why there's a need for definite lines so that we can get to a place of productivity in the things of God. We'll talk more about that on Wednesday. I hope this made sense because I really believe it's time to draw some lines in the sand. I'm, 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 I'm using these things in scripture as examples so that we can extract the application that lines are necessary in your life. I'm not really trying to teach on, you know, gender. That's, that's not what we're trying to teach on. I'm trying by the grace of God to teach on the fact that there need to be lines and the benefit of lines. You know, if you go to Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls, not too long, not too far from here, there are barriers everywhere. There are definite lines everywhere. And there are t- signs that say, don't cross over here, don't. <laughs> lines are good. Lines in the street, parking lines. Went to an appointment on yesterday and I had to pull into a parking lot, pulled into the parking lot, and uh, I watched someone um, park their car illegally because they were double parked. And another car pulls in. After the other car has now been double parked, the line is, they're literally sitting on the line. Another car pulls up to park next to the vehicle that's double parked. And they're just going by sight. I hope you're catching this. They're just going by sight and they're saying, I've got enough space to park my car. They don't even know that the car that they're judging by is double parked, illegally parked. And what do they do? They pull into the next space over only to double park themselves, get out, don't pay any attention to it, and go into the place. I I don't even think they understood that they had done something illegal. All they saw was, I see a car, I see another open space, let me go ahead and pull in. When they didn't understand that the first car that pulled in illegally parked. And they probably had a good reason to to illegally park because they were bringing someone out in a wheelchair and all of the other handicapped spaces um, and wheelchair accessible spaces were all taken. And so they pulled in double parked so that they could get the wheelchair out, get their person out, and wheel them into into the facility, all right? They did it because they needed to do it, but if you just look at the lines, it's, it's illegal. Hear me carefully. So another car pulls up, all they see is a vehicle and another open space. Not looking at the lines, they're just looking at the vehicle. And they know that they can fit their vehicle next to that vehicle, so they just pull in. And the only way to make sure they've got enough space on both sides of their car is to double park as well. And I don't even think they knew that they double parked. They just went based upon what this other person has done. Not knowing that the other person had already crossed the line. I'm hoping that we're not just following the world system because that's what they do. And we're just mindlessly going along with it. We'll talk more on next Wednesday. The Lord say the same. I hope this makes sense. Father, thank you. Thank you for so much that you, for so much that you've shared with us on tonight. I pray that you would give us wisdom, 
on how to apply this lesson to our lives. God, I give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for all the things that you have done. God, I give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Help us to rest in your word tonight. And help us to be reminded of the fact, God, that you're sharing this stuff with us, not because you hate us, not because you're mad with us, but because you love us. And we'll thank you for that in advance. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I hope to see you at Front Park this coming Sunday. The Lord say the same. God bless.